So do y'all remember uh, about a, maybe about a month ago or so I said that uh, that was the best Raw of the year and I'd be damned if they could tap it? Well, they did it tonight. This Raw, best of the year so far, and uh, at the pace WWE is going, it wouldn't surprise me if they did manage to top this one, but they're going to have to step it up even further to top this one. Whereas, a few weeks ago, that Monday Night Raw had a few good segments. This Monday Night Raw had a lot of good segments. It was mostly good segments. There weren't too many things that I could really complain about. But anyway, I'm going to get into this one. This was a great Monday Night Raw. I missed a little bit of it because I was at a friend's house. And then I ended up coming back over to my house. And I missed, I think, two segments of it. But I did... It was pretty early in the show. And I was able to look it up on WWE Fan Nation. And I saw what went down. But anyway... We start off the show with John Cena coming out. He's cutting a promo. Uh, No, it's Brad Maddox who came out at first. And, you know, being the GM, he's saying blah, 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 a bunch of garbage nobody really cared about. John Cena interrupts him shortly after he comes out. And Brad Maddox pretty much says, you know what, I'm going to give you the opportunity to pick your opponent at SummerSlam. And John Cena's like, that is a horrible decision because I could pick... I could pick Michael Cole. He wrestles like a girl. Speaking of that, I could pick, you know, one of the Bellas. You know, just pretty much saying the bad things about what Brad Maddox did. And then Randy Orton comes out, and he says that he's got the Money in the Bank briefcase, but he's not going to make a dumb decision like Cena did. When he had the briefcase last year, he's going to use it when opportunity comes. And he said that he was going to tell C- he likes to be straight up, so he told Cena that when opportunity when opportunity strikes, Randy Orton will f- he will not hesitate to cash in his briefcase. And I was completely confused when this happened. At first, I swear I thought I was thinking I swear if he comes out and just says Fandango and leaves, I was going to flip. But then Fandango's music hits. He comes down to the ring and he's like. No, Randy. You're not going to challenge you're not going to cash in on John Cena because you're going to cash in your money in the bank briefcase on me. And then they end up getting into a, a little brawl there cuz Fandango goes to turn to Cena and say something and or- Orton hits him from behind. They get into a little scuffle. That transitions into a match between Randy Orton and Fandango. It was actually a really good match. I enjoyed watching it. Fandango had some high spots. Orton still looked good, but I'm get, I'm really getting tired of Orton doing this thing where he pumps up the crowd. It's just not his style. I mean, back when he was like when he split from Legacy, and he was the face. He didn't he didn't pump up the crowd like he does now. He wasn't babyface. He was just he just wasn't a heel pretty much. That was just what made him the face is that he wasn't the heel. And now he's gotten to the point in this sort of boring Randy Borton as he's become. I mean, just him pumping up the crowd. It doesn't look natural. And now, especially with what happened later on to the, in the night, and with what Orton said earlier, he how he said, I'm not going to make a dumb decision like you did, Cena, last year. I'm going When opportunity strikes, I'm going to capitalize on it. So that's that seems like a little bit of a heelish thing to say. So I still think the heel turn is coming. And I'm glad I didn't do a full Money in the Bank review because I was a little biased as far as the outcome of the matches, just because I didn't get what I want. That was pretty much what it was. It, the matches at Money in the Bank all last night were they were all good, except for Jericho versus Ryback. But for the most part, it was unpredictable last night. I'll say that. But this Monday Night Raw sort of it turned that to it, to its advantage. Yeah, it turned it to its advantage. So whatever happened at Money in the Bank last night that I didn't like, pretty much turned into something I enjoyed tonight. So after that match, we had Mark Henry come out, and if I do these a little bit out of order, I'm sorry, and I apologize, but later on we saw Mark Henry come out, and he was talking about sort of um, sort of his response to what happened at Money in the Bank, and the crowd's chanting, chanting, you tapped out, and Mark Henry, he's like, well, if John Cena would pick me to be his opponent, and I'd get my rematch at SummerSlam, he's like, yeah, I tapped out, but he... Y'all, all y'all asses would have tapped out, too. You know, just still coming in with some of the one-liners that he's got. Well, that wasn't really a one-liner, but still with those clever things that he says. Anyway, so Mark Henry's talking about Money in the Bank. 
the Shields music drops, and I swear, it kind of, like, started and stopped there for a minute. It was, like, you heard it, and then it stopped, and then it, like, played again. It was just, like, a little snippet, I don't know, some sort of mistake there. But the Shield comes out, the crowd was cheering. I had thought this would be the Shield turning babyface, maybe leading to a feud between the Shield and the Wyatts, but I'm not too sure exactly what kind of angle they were trying to sell. I think this made the Shield look like a face team, but that's just me. So then the Shield comes down, they surround Mark Henry, and I don't know. Anyways, so the Shield then comes out and surrounds the ring. Mark Henry it looked like he might have, I mean, he wasn't backing down, he wasn't going to leave the ring. And, you know, commentary's playing up like, Mark, you got to get out of there. And then the Shield hops up onto the apron. Mark Henry takes off his jacket, throws it in Roman Reigns' face, and knocks him off the apron. Mark Henry gets the upper hand at first, and this is what I love about this segment. So then, it looks like Mark Henry's starting to overpower the Shield. Dean Ambrose hops on the back, sort of trying to lock in a sleeper hold or something to try and slow down Mark Henry. He fights off Seth Rollins, and then Roman Reigns takes him out with a spear. I was... When I was watching this, I was like, I swear, if they get this, if they can do the three-man powerbomb on him, they've got to do the powerbomb. And that's exactly what they did. They got the three-man powerbomb, they picked him up there, the triple powerbomb, onto Mark Henry. And this is what I like about the segment so much. It made the Shield look dominant. We haven't seen the Shield attack anybody in a dominant fashion since. So, uh, my TV's still on, but anyway. We haven't seen the Shield take out anyone in a dominant fashion since... Ooh, what did they do at Payback? The Shield of the Tag Team Titles. I don't... They didn't really take anybody out. I don't think they've really done this since around Wrestle... What did they do at Extreme Rules? Extreme Rules, it was the... I don't remember what the Shield did at Extreme Rules. Was that when they won the titles or was it at Payback? No, it was at Extreme Rules they won the title. So they haven't done this since before WrestleMania when they attacked Orton and Sheamus. I think that was the last time they ever did something this dominant. I mean, I know they triple power on the big show, but we haven't seen an attack like this from the Shield since WrestleMania. So this was something that definitely had to be done, and I'm glad it was done. It brought back the, the dominant side of the Shield. This could possibly lead to a potential face turn if they're going to go up against the Wyatts, but I'm not too sure if WWE is going to go that route just yet. Maybe save that for more of around the Survivor Series time, but I'm not sure. But anyway, the Shield looked dominant in this segment. This was definitely... I can't even start naming what would be my fa favorite segment at this point. I'm just going to move into the next one. So then we have a rematch from Money in the Bank that had been set up by Brad Maddox in his statement earlier on. It was Dolph Ziggler versus the World Heavyweight Champion, Alberto Del Rio. And once again, for Money in the Bank, one of these situations where I was conflicted. I did not like that Del Rio is still the champion. I am still furious that Del Rio is still the champion. But it built into a storyline. So the good thing is, I mean, Del Rio, they put on a good match at Money in the Bank. So the good thing is I can just ignore the world title now. Unless Del Rio goes up against a legit contender, which I don't know who they're going to possibly book to face Del Rio at SummerSlam, if the world title will even be on the line, which I assume it will be. But it doesn't seem like they can have it, because they don't have anybody. But we have about a month until then, so I'm not sure. But anyway, so Ziggler, he had some crazy, he had some crazy spots in this one. He, um, Del Rio went to throw him over the top rope, sort of like a back body drop to the outside. Ziggler almost did a freaking handstand on the top rope as he was going to the outside when he get, landed on his stomach still, but seriously, Ziggler is out of control with his selling. And then it looks like Ziggler is going to be... Uh, I forget exactly how this happened, but it looked like Ziggler was going to be in the cross arm bar. He breaks out of it. He ends up getting into a Famouser off the top rope, goes for the cover, and the bell rings before he even hooks the leg. Everyone looks over, and it's AJ who had rung the bell. AJ then comes into the ring. No, wait. Dolph Ziggler's still looking at AJ like, what, are, what did you just do? What are you doing? And the match never ended. Del Rio comes in with a super kick to the side of the head of, De of Ziggler. Gets the gets the one, two, three. Del Rio leaves the ring with a victory. AJ comes into the ring. She starts slapping Dolph Ziggler. And then Ziggler's trying to like push her away. The ref's just standing there not doing anything. And then Ziggler finally gets AJ away, or AJ sort of backs up. Ziggler turns around, and Big E just blasts him with a clothesline. Big E just completely dominates Ziggler with this clothesline. 
And then Big E sets him up, hits him with a big ending. And I like the sell jobs that some of the superstars do, like Ziggler and Kurt Hawkins did. Or when Big E hits the big ending, they just sort of... Their momentum carries them up so that they're sort of on their knees, and then they just flop back to the ground on their face. I just think that's a great sell job for the big ending. But anyway, so it's a, we're going to see Big E versus Dolph Ziggler at SummerSlam. Only one of the great matches that have already pretty much been set up for tonight. So then we have R-Truth come out, and I was like, who the hell is R-Truth putting over here? Because there is no way that WWE, I was, I was pretty much in denial. I was like, great, who's R-Truth going to win against? Who's, like, who is W going to squash? But I, what I really was saying, I wasn't thinking this, but what I was saying, I'm like, okay, who is R-Truth going to lose to tonight? And R-Truth comes in the ring, Brooklyn, New York! Wuss! And then everything cuts to static, and we see the Wyatt family just like they did last week. He lights the lantern, we're here. And then he blows it out. Once again, the lights are all out, the Wyatt family coming out with the lantern. Bray Wyatt sits down into the chair, blows out the blows out the lantern, we see Luke Harper and Eric Rowan in the ring, and they attack R-Truth, I don't, I sort of missed part of this segment here, because I was still at my friend's house, and I was kind of getting distracted, but, I'm not exactly sure what happened, but Truth was then out of the ring, Bray Wyatt comes into the ring with a microphone, and he's, he actually cut a pretty good promo, I actually, I really liked his promo. He was talking all about, you know, his usual Bray Wyatt stuff, sort of like what he did last week, just sort of going into more detail on it. Truth hops back on, onto the apron. He's got that R-Truth look on his face. He's got a steel chair in his hand, and he points to Bray Wyatt. He's like, I want you. So then Bray's like, you want me? Eric Rowan and Luke Harper end up leaving the ring. Bray Wyatt's like, okay, if you want me, come and get me. And he throws his head up into the air just not even looking he's got his eyes closed looking to the ceiling I mean his eyes are closed but he's got his head sort of directed at the ceiling R-Truth comes in with the chair gingerly starts to somewhat go towards him looking around at Eric Rowan and Luke Harper he backs into the corner Rowan and um, Harper are sort of almost at the point where they can keep getting cut off but anyway like I was saying Eric Rowan and Luke Harper are almost at the point where they could grab R-Truth by the feet and sort of like sweep him out into the ring post like they've like people have done before, and then our truth he takes like one look at Eric Rowan. I hope I have these names right. I'm pretty sure Luke Harper's the one with the black hair, and Eric Rowan's the bald one. But anyway, Truth takes a quick look over at ringside, and Bray Wyatt flies into the corner and just squashes him with some sort of flying body press into the corner. And then Bray Wyatt proceeds to start beating down on Truth. Luke Harper and Eric Rowan re-enter the ring, and they start beating him down. Off goes Bray Wyatt's hat. He does his little. Um, not he doesn't do the pose yet, but he sets up R Truth and hits his finisher, which is that, like, that sort of like spinning neck breaker, like where he holds him down almost by his like waist, and then does sort of like a back. I don't know what to call it, but sort of like a. It's in W thirteen. It was I think the finisher like Mike Knox had at one point. I'm th- pretty sure it was Husky Harris's finisher too, but he does the that I don't know whatever finisher he used to have. He still has it. That little spinning neck breaker. I think we've seen Fandango use it before. It's sort of like a another version of it. I think he's used it once against maybe one of the... I don't know. But anyway, Bray Wyatt hits his finisher, then drops down to his knees and poses with Luke Harper and Eric Rowan around him just like they did last week against Kane. Bray Wyatt grabs the mic again. He says, this isn't the truth we're looking for. Kane, follow the buzzards or something like that. And then Bray Wyatt, their music hits, and that leads into a commercial then we come back this was a point where i was like leaving between uh my friend's house and my house so i missed the next two segments but it was the wwe active segment and wow i actually now see that the number one trend worldwide was our truth interesting but anyway at that point anyway so then we had the wwe active match which was we the people or as they're now called the real americans they should be we the people Antonio Cesaro and Jack Swagger would go up against either Tons of Funk, the Primetime Players, and the Usos. And my god, the Usos, what aren't they more over then at this point? I mean, blame-wise, I guess, but anyway. Ugh, anyway. uh, If you guys don't know who Wise Now is, make sure to go check him out on YouTube. Um, But anyway, so the Usos came out, and because they had won the poll, I swear these polls are rigged. If... Primetime players would have won if it wasn't 
a WWE, I don't know. WWE's rigging these WWE active polls. I don't think there's really any way. I don't even know if it's real that they take in the percentage of votes that they get, but I don't, I don't know what they do. They just randomly generate stuff to make it look real. But anyway, the Usos ended up winning the poll, and they went out to face the real Americans, and the Usos ended up getting the victory. I don't know how it went. I probably should have looked at this on WWE Fan Nation. I'm actually going to do that real quick. All right, so it turned out that Antonio Cesaro was going for his little gut wrench suplex, and one of the Usos reversed it into a sunset flip roll-up, and that was actually a pretty nice counter. And so the Usos ended up getting the victory off the roll-up. Definitely a much more convincing roll-up than the Ryback roll-up on Chris Jericho last night at Money in the Bank. But anyway, then we go on to another match that I missed between Christian and Damian Sandow. This one I had already looked up on the YouTube channel, so I did see how this one went down. It actually looked pretty well. I don't know, Christian, if he really needed this one last run, he's sort of mad at this point. But, I mean, he's still he's still doing decent. Um, he's still a good wrestler. I like to watch him wrestle, but I don't know. He's definitely not in his prime, just to put it lightly. But, I mean, Christian, he can still put on decent matches. But, anyway, so we have Damian Sandow going into this one. Goes for the elbows, the, what is it, the Komito... Akiet, the elbow of disdain, as he likes to... I don't know what language that is, but anyway. Setting him up for the elbow of disdain, Christian counters into another roll-up, gets the victory. So Christian gets a win over Sandow. Sandow grab, gets the briefcase, and, you know, he's like, and still, your money in the bank, you know... Or, no, he was like your intellectual savior of money in the bank, Damian Sandow. And then we see Cody Rhodes come from behind, and he starts firing away at Sandow with some left and right hands off a spear sort of takedown. They get into a little bit of a skirmish where Cody Rhodes just pretty much attacks Sandow, and then the security comes out and stops Cody Rhodes, and that was that. Then I get back, and of course the match I return to is Naomi versus Brie Bella. Don't need to know about that. Then we have pure gold on the mic between Paul Heyman and CM Punk. That was a great segment even before the action began. We have Paul Heyman pretty much saying how he created CM Punk. Well, not not he didn't say created, but pretty much how he, how CM Punk was just one of Paul Heyman's fantasies, and how without Paul Heyman, CM Punk would not be the best in the world. Pretty much saying how we were champion, we or we were the longest reigning WWE champion for over 430 something days. We were the man who almost ended the Undertaker's streak, you know, pretty much all of Punk's achievement was because of Paul Heyman, and that Paul Heyman, it was like, CM Punk didn't do it on his own, it was because of Paul Heyman, and then CM Punk fires, or, er, Paul Heyman also goes after how CM Punk has nobody in his life, like, he has no family, the only people he has is the WWE Universe, and then CM Punk comes back with saying how um, Paul Heyman knows CM Punk, how he will, he's relentless to get what he wants, and that he wants Paul Heyman and he will destroy anyone he has to go through, whether it be Brock Lesnar, I guess Curtis Axel, I don't know, whoever gets in his way, he will take them down in order to get to Paul Heyman. CM Punk also says that he swears on Paul Heyman's children that he will get to Paul Heyman, and he will burn down everything around Paul Heyman until Heyman is the last man standing, and then... With what little life Heyman has left, CM Punk will proceed to hurt Paul Heyman even worse than Paul Heyman hurt CM Punk. So that was actually a really good seg. It was an amazing segment. I'm beginning to think that Paul Heyman and Curtis, A or not Curtis Axel, wow. I'm beginning to think that maybe it was Zeb Coulter and Paul Heyman who wrote this show again. Or it Paul Heyman had to have his fingers on a few of these segments. If it was definitely this one, this... I'm pretty sure any segment from here on out between any Paul Heyman any Paul Heyman segment, whether it involves CM Punk or Brock Lesnar, is going to involve Paul Heyman. He's going to have written it. So this was another good segment, and Paul Heyman ends up saying, let me spell out what your fate is. And then he does CM Punk's little thing, it's clobbering time! And then Brock Lesnar's theme hits. The Beast comes down to the ring, and Brock Lesnar, he gets over to the ring, Paul Heyman sort of goes behind CM Punk as Punk has the mic in hand like he's ready to take on Lesnar. Heyman slides into the ring from behind and attacks Punk from behind. Lesnar then grabs Punk by the legs and sweeps him out under the bottom rope. 
Punk and Lesnar go at it. Punk gets thrown into the barricade. But Punk still con continues to fight back. He gets thrown over the announce table. Punk then hops onto the announce table and dives at Lesnar, who catches him, slams him back first into the ring post, and then proceeds to F5 him onto the announce table. Punk then tries to get up after Lesnar and Heyman leave, and he sort of struggles to make it back to his feet. He eventually leaves. But this was a really good segment. This should be the main event, e despite what the what they reveal later on in the show. I still think, you know what, screw the titles. This is the main event. Brock Lesnar vs. CM Punk should, and I assume will be the main event at SummerSlam, but one can only we can only hope. I assume that's what it's going to be, though. But, I mean, you know what they say about assuming. And what happened next stole the show. Point blank, this next match was fantastic between Chris Jericho and Rob Van Dam. The crowd, the crowd was really into this one. The crowd was really hyped for this match. The crowd was pretty good all night, for the for the majority of the time. The crowd was excellent. This Brooklyn crowd actually did very well. Definitely glad that we could get a good crowd for th this. Was like good crowd, good show. This definitely was better than I for people who even thought this could be contested by the first draw after Mania. That was just a good crowd. With like one or two good segments. This one, this one was just gold, period. So then we have this match between Chris Jericho and Rob Van Dam. Stole the show. This is definitely, I think this should be a match of the year candidate between these two. They went out and put on a show. Not as good of a match as they could have put on if they were in their prime. But it was still a really good match between Jericho and RVD. We saw RVD hit some of his spots. The torque he puts into that rolling thunder. He sort of like pops his head out one more time just to see the crowd's reaction right before he hits it. Um, he ended up hitting a springboard moonsault out on, onto the floor. Um, Chris Jericho ended up connecting with a lion salt. Um, RVD went for the split leg moonsault mist, which led into the lion salt. Jericho had the walls of Jericho locked in one time. RVD's cut for Money in the Bank ended up get, getting opened up, and there was a little bit of blood on there. You know, oh my god, PG, there's blood. Yeah, we got a little bit of that tonight. Especially once the walls of Jericho was locked, and it really started to come out there. Um, I mean, it wasn't like covering his face, but there was a decent amount of blood there. I mean, for PG, it was a lot, but anyway. So then we see... <laughs> wow, Twitter, anyway. But anyway, from the Cena segment, don't hinder gender. Anyway, so RVD ends up getting the victory. The, this was just a gold match. RVD deserved to win this one. And the only way to do it is by the frog splash. RVD... Got some sick height on that frog splash. One, two, three, RVD defeats Chris Jericho. This was a great match. Definitely match of the night. Match of the year candidate. It stole the show. Only because... I can't... I would like to say this could have made... This could have been the very end of to the show. But what, the, what they did with John Cena next kind of had to be the end of the show. Because, I mean, the crowd was hot off of that one. They wanted to carry it through. And that's what they did. So then we have hashtag Cena's choice for SummerSlam as Brad Maddox gave Cena the opportunity to pick his opponent at SummerSlam. John Cena comes out. We have the WWE locker room on the stage minus a few superstars like Mark Henry after his attack from The Shield. CM Punk after his attack from Lesnar. Lesnar wasn't there. Just to name a few guys who weren't there. People pointed out that we had guys like RVD and Jack Swagger standing next to each other. Guess the singlets and all that stuff. Haha. <laughs> anyway. Also, for speeding and weeding, anyway, but, hashtag weed the people, but anyway, so, Dan John Cena comes out, doesn't actually do, he says a few things about, um, like, he's like, I can't, I can't pick who my opponent is, like, you guys wanted me to be able to pick who my opponent would be, I was given the opportunity, I've been approached by several superstars in that locker room, s telling me why they should be challenging for my title, well, I can't make that decision because I haven't decided yet. So I'm going to leave it up to you, the WWE Universe. Thank God the Usos, the most over faction in the freaking company. Thank God it wasn't the Usos who ended up challenging John Cena for the WWE title. Anyway, so Cena, you know, hyping up the crowd, going to different people. He's like, well, what about the great Kali? The crowd, boo. What about the Mexican arist or El Presidente? Alberto Del Rio, crowd boos. What about, I mean, if, I forget what they said. Like, if we have a problem, we, we can call 1-800-FELLA to get Sheamus, right? Boo. What about, 
a man who just put on a great match, Y2J Chris Jericho. There was a mix of cheers and boos, but it was more drowned out by the boos. What about Mr. Money in the Bank, Randy Orton? Slight cheers, but there were a lot of boos that just drowned it out. What about the other man in that match, RVD? There, that one was definitely probably about a 50-50 in cheers and boos at the beginning. I think it was sort of split. I wouldn't say 50-50, though. It was, I don't know. I, it was probably more boos than cheers, but it, there, you could definitely hear the cheers for that one. Some RVD chants. Well, what about a man who can dance, Fondango? People were fond of in the crowd, but really no cheers. There was some, there were some boos, but not a, not too big of a reaction there. And then he's like, "Well, what about I? I see you breathing over there, all heavy. What about Ryback?" Crowd boos. So then he's like, "Well, I mean, I think we pretty much covered everybody." He mentioned three MB, don't hinder gender. He's Slater, blah blah blah. And he's like, "Well, I think that pretty much covered anybody. I think we got everybody." The crowd's like, "No, no, like, did, I don't think I missed anybody." The crowd's like, "Yes." You know, the entire time they're chanting for Daniel Bryan, the yes chance, the no chance, they were just all up for Daniel Bryan. And John Cena's like, well, I choose to face... He really dragged this out, too. He's like, well, I choose to face me for the, my WWE Championship at SummerSlam, Daniel Bryan. And then the crowd is all, yes, yes. And then Daniel Bryan's music head, he's coming down to the ring, yes, yes, yes. And then he comes into the ring gets up in Cena's face and continues to do the yes chance. He's, like, right up in Cena's face as Cena sort of holding the title out, like, in his hand. Daniel Bryan, yes, yes, along with the crowd. The crowd, Daniel Bryan's... Michael Cole even mentioned about Daniel Bryan being the hottest guy in the company right now. So, now that I can look back on this, I'm glad I didn't do a review for Money in the Bank because this show pretty much solved all the problems that I had. Pretty much, this show was gold. It was golden. For whatever I didn't like at Money in the Bank, this show made up for it. And what I did like at Money in the Bank, this continued to build off of it. This Monday Night Raw, I'll give it a... Do I want to go 9 or 9.5? I'll give it about a 9 or a 9.5 out of 10. Because it was really good. I wouldn't give it perfect, though. Because of, you know, some segments like Naomi versus Brie Bella. And uh, they did a little WWE... Divas, that Total Divas, whatever crap show they had promoting. Um, the We the People thing could have been a little bit better. So, I mean, probably about a 9.5. Because this was this was a damn good show. I'd like to see WWE top this one. Because I last time I said I'll be damned if they could top it. Now, I mean, a good show a month works for me. And especially if they get better like this. But anyway. So, it'll be Daniel Bryan versus John Cena at SummerSlam for the WWE Championship. This should not be the main event, though. CM Punk versus Brock Lesnar. Punk is a real underdog. Cena is exactly what he... CM Punk even stated this, that John Cena is the New York Yankees. Th Cena can never be an underdog in anything. But in this one, Daniel Bryan is being perceived as the underdog. He was chosen to face Cena. And I'm actually glad they did it this way now, because now we have the threat of Randy Orton. Maybe he turns heel. Maybe Daniel Bryan wins the WWE Championship at SummerSlam gets a glimpse of what it would be like to hold the WWE Championship, and then Randy Orton comes in and takes it away from him, cashes in Money in the Bank at SummerSlam, and becomes WWE Champion. That would be something pretty cool. We see Orton versus Daniel Bryan for the WWE That would actually be a really good feud, especially with Orton as a heel. I'd kind of like to see that, but I don't know exactly. I mean, we're getting what we're, the WWE Universe is getting what they want to get, so I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm not gonna make too many. I'm not gonna jump to too many conclusions. We still have about a month until the Money in the Bank pay per view, SummerSlam pay per view, but it's already shaping up to be a great pay per view. Punk vs. Lesnar, Brian vs. Cena. I'm pretty sure there was a third one, and I already forgot it, but I don't remember what it was. Anywho, oh yeah, Big E vs. Dolph Ziggler. This is shaping up to be a good pay per view. Wow, I just don't. I just don't know what to say about this anymore. This Monday Night Raw was gold, 9.5 out of 10. I want to know what you guys thought about this in the comments below. This was a long video. If you stuck it out to this point throughout the whole thing, even if you skipped a little bit of the segments and you got to this point, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe if you're new to the channel. I will. I do not do Raw reviews every week. I mean, as long as there's something good for me to review, I'll review it. But I don't know. If some Raws are really crappy, I probably won't do it. But anyway, thanks for watching this Raw review. Hit that like button. Leave a comment below what you thought about this. What did you think of this Monday Night Raw? Was it fantastic? Did you hate it? If you hated it, what is wrong with your brain? I'm just kidding. But anyway, what did you think of this Raw? 
What do you think of the match set up for SummerSlam? What match could you possibly see coming? Peace. Keep on YouTube and all that good stuff. Bye.